Hello everyone, how are you doing? My name is Andy and this is UFOs and other paranormal stuff. First things first ladies and gentlemen, what do you think of this? I finally got it through the post today. It has come, it's the official UFOs and other paranormal stuff podcast t-shirt available in black or like this one navy blue although it looks black on the screen you can get this and you can get a lot of other products on ufos and ops.com just go to the shop at the top and you can get loads of stuff there's tank tops there's cups uh different kinds of cups there's t-shirts like these hats as well have a little look and don't forget before the 31st of december i think it is if you type in uap 2022 you will get a 20 percent discount Just before I get started with this episode properly, I want to ask a favour. If there's anybody out there who has eyewitness accounts or knows somebody who has had eyewitness accounts of the Warminster thing, a UFO incident that happened in Warminster, I think it was in 1966, it was in the 1960s. Uh, anything to do with the Warminster thing UFO um, incident, please do let me know via the contact form on the website, uh, which you'll see below just there. Uh, but also, if you go on the Facebook groups, UFOs and other paranormal stuff, um, contact me through there. I would like to know. I would like to do a podcast about that uh, in the future. And it's a, it's a UFO incident, I think, was widely reported back in the day, but uh, not so much is known about it now, especially by me. And that has to be uh, rectified. So, yeah, if you can, just uh, send me a message, send me anything, even a voice note if you can, and I'll get back to you. Thank you very much. Today's episode, ladies and gentlemen, is called The Silent Twins, and it is about a, a pair of twins, two girls born on the 11th of April in 1963. June and Jennifer Gibbons were identical twins who grew up in the Welsh town of Haverford West. Uh, their parents, Gloria and Aubrey Gibbons, came to Britain from the Caribbean country of Barbados in the 1960s as part of what was known as the Windrush Generation. Uh, Windrush Generation was a name given to uh, Caribbean immigrants who migrated to Britain in the years following World War II uh, to help regenerate Britain, basically. Now, including June and Jennifer, uh, the couple had three other children. There was Greta, there was David, and there was Rosie. But it was June and Jennifer who were completely inseparable from each other, basically from the time they were born. They developed their own language. This is natural among, uh, among twins and is known as idioglossia. Their version, however, became an example of something called cryptophasia, a type of idioglossia that only two people involved in its invention can understand. That wasn't the problem exactly. The problem was that June and Jennifer would only ever say anything to each other. Oh, and sometimes their little sister Rosie too. That was it. Their childhood was tough. They were the only black children in Haverford West and sadly they were often singled out at school. This caused so much trauma for the girls that they had to be let out of school early every single day to avoid any bullying. That's sad. That's quite sad, really. Now, the twins did everything together. They, they even began moving together. When I mean moving together, I don't just mean that wherever one went, the other went as well. I mean they moved in perfect unison together. They walked almost as if they were in a march, both using left foot, then right foot, then left foot... You know, you get the idea. Arms swinging in unison. And they would walk right next to each other. A teacher followed them home one day and reported that the girls never deviated from this at all. When either one of the girls folded their arms, for example, the other one would do the exact same. When one stood up, the other one would stand up too. 
and they made the actions at the exact same time. The sisters became much more reserved and eventually they spoke to no one except each other. Not even their little sister Rosie anymore. But they did talk to their dolls. When Aubrey, the girl's father, would eavesdrop on his daughters talking to each other or to their dolls, he could not understand what they were saying. He would be able to catch the odd word, but to Aubrey, it sounded like June and Jennifer were speaking in a foreign language. They stayed on at school, but they refused to read and write. In the early 1970s, a school nurse was giving pupils vaccinations and noted that the girls were completely impassive to the injections. Normally a kid would jump at the sight of a needle or especially when the injection is going in, you know, they wouldn't be too happy about it. But these two girls were just completely impassive to it. They made no noise at all, they didn't even wince. The doctor likened it to them being in a trance-like state and decided to notify a child psychologist. He had seen this kind of behaviour before, but only in severely traumatised war veterans. June and Jennifer began to see a succession of therapists who tried to get them to communicate with other people. Unfortunately, because of the girls' muteness, none of them could supply a diagnosis. Maybe the girls don't know how to talk. Maybe they did, but they just didn't want to. If they did know how to talk, but were refusing to do, to do that, that could have some pretty disturbing implications. Because if this was all just an act by the girls, it was the most committed performance that any of the doctors and specialists had ever seen. Some of the teachers thought that something very dark was happening to the girls. Some thought something supernatural was at play here, believing that June was being mind-controlled by Jennifer. Speech therapists said that they could see that June really wanted to tell things, but something would happen. Jennifer was stopping June with an expressionless gaze that seemed full of power. She was making the decisions. June was being possessed by her twin. Girls School decided that they could help no more and made the decision to transfer the girls to Eastgate School where they could work one-on-one -on -one with a dedicated teacher. There was virtually no progress other than the girls would now only communicate with others using handwritten letters. After one year with no improvement, the school gave in. They couldn't help the girls and took the decision that the only way left to help June and Jennifer get out of their seemingly self-imposed life of non-communication was to separate them. One of the Eastgate teachers said that June and Jennifer were in fact dying in each other's arms and we must save one of them even if it is at the price of the other. Jennifer agreed uh, with the idea to separate them as they both felt that they were holding the other one back as neither one of them wanted to be the first to change their situation and if they were apart they would not know what the other one was doing. But then June and Jennifer changed their minds and did something that they had never done before. They spoke. The girls now hated the idea of them about to become separated. So they took drastic action. One night, the girls' therapist at Eastgate received a call from a public payphone. He did not recognise the voice on the other end. The voice was speaking to him so fast that Mr Tim Thomas found it very hard to keep up with him. It said, Good morning, Mr Thomas. This is the twins. We're sorry about what happened today. We'd like you to know that if you don't separate us, we'll be talking again next week. Tim Thomas was shocked by the phone call. He Had he really heard one of the Gibbons twins speaking for the first time? He had trouble believing it until another teacher told him that they had received the same call and the same message. He told the school about the call, but any hope of progress was short-lived. The girls maintained their silence. They acted as if the phone call had never taken place. So with that it was decided that one of the girls would be sent to a boarding school in an attempt to break this self-inflicted silence. 
When the school told the twins, in, uh, it provoked an unprecedented reaction. Jennifer gave June a very men menacing glowering, and she started attacking June. Scratching her with her long nails just below the eye, the girls ran after each other really and really fought each other really hard, drawing blood and pulling out hair. Such was the viciousness of the fight that the staff were too shocked to try to break it up. As Ashley Flowers put it in her podcast, the usually silent twins were now female gladiators. When the staff managed to stop the girls fighting, June and Jennifer instantly went limp defeated. Jennifer stayed at Eastgate while June was sent to St David's Adolescent Unit, a boarding school. Being away from Jennifer, June became catatonic, refusing to move as well as the usual refusal to talk. Staff had to pick her up and move her around the building, propping up her body when they sat her down. She cried. June cried for hours in silence. The only time she would stop crying was when she spoke to Jennifer on the telephone. This upset the others at St David's. Other staff and students could see how much power Jennifer had over June. It was as if Jennifer had June on a leash. Some felt that Jennifer was using some sort of black magic on June. One stated her belief that June could have been a normal popular young girl if she had been released from her sister's grip. June, however, seemed reluctant to let that happen, and soon she started to hunger strike. The staff at St David's did not bother to force feed her, and she relented, reunited the twins, placing June back under Jennifer's control. Any hope of the twins' silence being broken was now lost, and Eastgate washed their hands of the Gibbons twins Jennifer and June. At the age of 16, the girls signed on with the local unemployment benefit office. They enjoyed their newfound freedom. This was, after all, exactly what the girls had wanted, to be left alone with each other and their dolls. They let their imaginations run wild as they wrote and then acted out plays using the dolls as the characters. June and Jennifer were immersed in a soap opera and had created a very detailed backstories for each of their dolls' personal lives. They would have their dolls marry each other, divorce, and when they decided that a doll had done its bit, dying. The dolls went to church, school, parties and held down jobs too. The twins spent hours creating props for the dolls to use and clothes for the dolls to wear. Could the girls be using the dolls to live their lives for them? It would seem that Jennifer and June were using the dolls to communicate with each other. The stories that the dolls acted out served as a life surrogate, if you like, for June and Jennifer. The thing is, all the while they were doing this, they were still not talking to anyone and hardly talking to each other either. And they still had to continue their synchrony as well, agreeing with each other beforehand all of the actions that they would make with the dolls while playing. Just like in the real world, nothing would happen in the dolls world unless both June and Jennifer agreed to it. At Christmas 1980, things started to change. The girls got a diary from their mum and they wrote down in detail what uh, went on in their lives with a lot of accuracy. The thing is, this was the very first time that they were each using and then writing down their very own thoughts. That seemingly threw the power dynamics of their twinship into question. They had always seen themselves as the same person. They would call the other one Jay, for example. But these diaries allowed the girls to express themselves on a level that they had never been used to before. The level of individuality. Analysis of Jennifer and June's diary entries shows that the girls seemed to find the other wanting. For the first time in their lives, they found that they were not equal and started resenting each other for that. Neither of the girls had the strength of mind to break their pact of silence and synchrony and the diaries were allowing the girls to be separate. They found this concept of normality daunting, 
but blamed the other for not allowing it to have happened sooner. They started to really despise each other. Jennifer wrote, Jay cannot be my real twin. My real twin was born at the exact same time as me, had my looks, my ways and my dreams and my ambitions. He or she will have my weaknesses, failures and opinions. All this makes a twin, no differences. I can't stand differences. By this time the girls were 17, they had gone through puberty. They were still locked together in the life that they had always had. They wanted the things that their dolls have, lives, friends, love. With that, they decided to try to go out into the, uh, into the world and see if they could be two different people. The people that they had yearned to be. The girls tried, but they could not start relationships as the silence that they had tried but failed to break got in the way, obviously. They decided to go after a boy that had once defended them during their days at Eastgate. June and Jennifer got all doled up and went to the town where the boy had lived when they knew him before. But by this time he had left and gone back to the United States where he was originally from. But the girls decided that they would go with his brothers instead. At first this was exciting to them. It was effectively a new life. But the new life entailed heavy drinking and doing drugs. We all know that alcohol loosens the tongue and substance, uh, adds substance abuse to that and the tongue has a mind of its own. The twins were now loosened up and their silence had been with them for their whole lives was nowhere to be seen all the while they were drunk. But this time with the boys brought confusion to June and Jennifer. See, all the while the girls were having a good time and enjoying themselves, the boys didn't even like the twins. They just tolerated them. Then Jennifer did something that made her very different from her twin sister June. She lost her virginity to one of the boys. Jennifer had spent years demanding that the girls act the same, exactly the same way, as she was scared that June might outshine her. It was indeed Jennifer that took this huge step, trying to make herself the more attractive, lovable, friendly sister and the more desired sister. She now saw herself as a woman, while June was just a little girl still. Their equality was gone. This created anger in the girls and that anger became a burning rage. Two days after the deed was done with one of the boys, Jennifer attacked June again. While arguing about the volume of the radio, Jennifer took the radio's power cable and wrapped it tightly around the neck of her sister until June begged her to stop. She stopped. Both girls snuck out and went for a walk, still shaken from the incident in the bedroom just now. But the peaceful walk was cut short, now by June attacking Jennifer. She pushed Jennifer off of a bridge and into a raging river. She jumped in after Jennifer, but only to try to finish the job. It was only when car headlights hit upon the girls did they stop fighting in the water. June pulled Jennifer back to the bank and said, I love you. Jennifer, while still spitting out water, replied, I love you. After all this, it was obvious things were never going to be the same. The girls went absolutely out of control. The girls would wander the neighbourhood, break into people's homes and vandalise them, and then upon leaving would report these break-ins to the police by using a public telephone. The police ignored them as they did not have enough as evidence. With the police not doing anything, the girls upped their game. They broke into a tennis club, doused ethanol everywhere, then set the place on fire. The next day, they burned down a tractor store. The police could not ignore the crimes now. Serious damage had been caused. A few weeks later, a plainclothes police uh, placed in the area on a hunch heard a window break. When they arrived at the broken into building, they found the girls with a lit match and a bottle of ethanol each. They had been caught red-handed. When the police raided their house and their bedroom, they found all the items that the girls had stolen from the previous break-ins. Their most recent diary entries described the beautiful flames that the tractor store made as it went up. The once silent, lifeless twins had become criminals together and they were placed in prison.
When the girls were first placed in the prison cell, they just stood there for hours holding their bed sheets. Warders had to go in and make the beds for them, place the girls into the beds, actually put their heads on the pillows and even close their eyes for them. The girls completely regressed back to the way they were at school. Complete silence, complete synchrony, no eye contact. They did, however, enter into a pact with each other, a pact with very high stakes, a starvation pact. They would alternate which one would eat one day and which one would eat the next day. They went to a hospital ward and while they were there, doctors decided to separate the twins and get them away from this cycle of destruction. But things got worse as by separating them, neither of them knew if the other one was eating or not, and so they both flatly refused to eat. Staff noticed that the girls were in perfect sync with each other while they were parted. If one was reading a book, the other one was reading a book too. If one was walking around, staff would find the other one walking around too. If June was asleep, so was Jennifer, and all this would happen when they were in other parts of the building. They couldn't even see each other, yet when they were together, they would fight viciously. June referred to Jennifer as her shadow, and wrote in her diary that the day without her shadow was coming. She would ask herself, how can I get rid of my shadow? She often wondered if, without her shadow, would she die, or would she gain life? The girls faced a trial for arson and were convicted on 16 counts of burglary and arson and they were to be detained in Broadmoor Psychiatric Prison. They were diagnosed with psychotic personality disorder. Jennifer attempted suicide and June attacked a nurse within their first few days at Broadmoor. When the girls were apart they felt so lonely they wanted to die but when they were together they fought badly. All their lives, even up to now, no one could work out why the girls' silence had begun all those years ago. Tim Thomas, who had worked with the twins during their time at Eastgate, had difficulty with them, yes, but he did not believe that they should have been put in Broadmoor. He tried to raise interest in their case and managed to get a friend of his, Marjorie Wallace, a journalist with the Sunday Times, to get involved. Wallace was able to see the twins' diaries. She was surprised at what she found in those pages. She found poetry, which reflected the lives of the girls in the safety of that tiny bedroom at home. The language in the poetry was so powerful, Wallace was convinced that June, Jennifer and June did not belong in Broadmoor. She, but she needed to convince the courts by explaining their silence. Wallace stated that the criminal behaviour was misunderstood cry for help. The girls were desperate and they knew that the silent pact was wrong but they did not know how to break that pact. Wallace thinks that the girls saw the police and the justice system as a force for good and a way to help the girls out of that pact of silence and to get to a normal life. They reported their own crimes, remember. Basically, Marjorie Wallace believes that the way the twins were referred to as one person their parents used to call them the Twinnies instead of individually June and Jennifer, started to rub off on the girls big time in their youth, hence why they would walk, dress and act in perfect synchrony, exactly the same as the other one. And as this was forced on them from such an early age, they actually had no clue of what their individuality even was, let alone what it meant. Neither one of them really wanted to be the first out of their little pact as they thought going their separate ways might actually kill them. June and Jennifer were not crazy or possessed. They were badly misunderstood for their entire lives. Marjorie Wallace felt able to help June and Jennifer and advocated for their case to be re-evaluated. She also tried to help the girls to start talking. Having read the diary entries, she was able to connect with the girls in a way that nobody else was. She broke their silence. After 12 years in Broadmoor, the girls were able to appeal for their release. Wallace prepared them for release, but she noted, a few weeks before their release, the girls' attitude changed. 
ain't changed bad. June and Jennifer made a new pact, a death pact. The girls told Wallace that when they were released, one of them was going to die. Wallace tried to reassure them and did not want to hear anything more about this death pact. They were released on the 9th of March in 1993. The day before that, Jennifer had been sick twice. They said their goodbyes and they left Broadmoor Prison by van. A few minutes into the journey, Jennifer laid her head on June's shoulders, absolutely exhausted, and she went to sleep. When the time came to get off of the van, Jennifer would not wake up. She had died. The pact was fulfilled. Jennifer's cause of death still remains unknown even now. Maybe deep down, Jennifer knew that it was now time to let June go and to let her get on with her life. Of course, June was crushed by her, the death of her sister. But once her grief had subsided, she was able to finally get on and live a normal life. <laughs>